Oh, we're just going to give it another minute or two to let people trickle in. Okay, we'll start very shortly. Um, thanks for putting your well, um, your info in the chat. Yeah, everyone's welcome to introduce themselves in the chat if you'd like. That'd be great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started and people will continue to find their way in. So welcome, thank you for being here. Um, this event is Best Practices for HIV Research Community Advisory Councils, and it's put on by the New England HIV Implementation Science Research Network, or the network. Uh, my name is Daniel Davidson. I'm one of the assistant directors at CIRA. Um, and along with my colleague, David Zelaya, I'm the organizer for uh, these network events. So if it's your first time joining us for one of these network events, we are a joint initiative of CIRA, or the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS at Yale, um, and the Providence Boston CIFAR. Um, CIRA is part of the Yale School of Public Health. We are an HIV research center funded by the NIMH, and the Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research is a partnership between Brown University and Boston University Boston Medical Center, which is aimed at reducing the global burden of HIV infection. Um, the network started in 2014 with an inaugural symposium, and it was created to stimulate and support, uh, sorry, we can put up the next, um, next slide, Pete, actually two slides, uh, to stimulate and support research and evaluation collaborations across New England, to foster partnerships among agencies, stakeholders, and researchers, and to focus on implementation science in small urban areas with a high prevalence of HIV. Um, so there's been a lot of interest in today's event, and we would love to hear what else you would find useful to help advance collaborative implementation science. So uh, you're welcome to put your suggestions in the brief survey that will pop up after uh, the event ends, or you can let us know in the chat, or you can um, let us know during the Q&A. So I will turn it over to David to tell us what we're in store for and to introduce our first speaker. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for that, Daniel. Um, so again, we're here today for best practices for HIV research and community community advisory councils. I'm very excited to introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, the first being uh, my close colleague, Dr. Aaron Guy. Uh, Dr. Aaron Guy is an investigator in the Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences at Brown University School of Public Health. She received her PhD in clinical psychology from the, from the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, Illinois and was a clinical psychology resident at the Edward Hines VA. Um, additionally, Dr. Guy completed an NIMH-funded T32 fellowship in biobehavioral HIV research at Brown University in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, while cross-training within the Alcohol Research Center on HIV and the Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies in the School of Public Health. Dr. Guy's work focuses on community-based participatory research with queer and trans people of color to develop and implement evidence-based behavioral health interventions. Their work aims to heal negative psychological uh, sequelae uh, resulting from stigma, reduce uh, HIV-related comorbidities, and increase HIV viral suppression with the ultimate goal of reducing HIV health inequities. Dr. Guy is the PI of a NIDA-funded K99ROO Aims, uh, aimed to adapt and test an acceptance and commitment therapy-based gender-affirming stigma intervention that targets substance use and, 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 and HIV risk among, among trans women. 
Um, their work spans across the Alcohol Research Center on HIV, the Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies, and the Mindfulness Center at Brown. Um, our second speaker for today is, par, is, is Paul uh, Goulet, uh, with more than 36 years of experience working in health policy and consumer advocacy. Paul is an, is an independent consultant specializing in community-engaged research to provide maximum impact with patient retention and health care, specifically for patients living with HIV and AIDS who are homeless, incarcerated, uh, participate in active drug use, mental health issues, trauma, or, or those who have not uh, been retained in, in uh, their health care. Paul has uh, previously served as program manager for special linkage and, and retention team at the Shapiro Clinic, the Center for Infectious Disease at Boston Medical Center, and was director of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's Consumer Office and director of community engaged research for 11 years, um, and was the former facilitator of the Massachusetts statewide cons uh, consumer advisory board for over 15 years. Paul is a board member of, of the National Quality Center uh, Consumer Advisory Council and chair of the Providence Boston CIFAR. Um, I am excited uh, to have both of you all uh, here today. And uh, to begin, we will hear from Dr. Guy. So I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, David. I'm so excited to be here and to be asked to um, give this talk uh, with Paul. So um, uh, yeah, let me just kind of jump right in. And um, today we'll go over some definitions of community engaged research um, and kind of just introduce the concept and the range of ways that community and researchers can work together. And then I'll talk about some core principles and examples. Um, there are many principles to community engaged research, but I really want to highlight three building trust for authentic partnerships, how to maintain equity, and how to make sure that our research and partnerships are mutually beneficial. Um, throughout, we'll have some audience participation with poll questions, and we'd love to take your questions in the chat throughout. So I'll pause um, after kind of each section of my slides so that we can take some questions. And um, Dr. Zelaya is gonna um, help us out with, with the questions in the chat. So let's do our first poll question. We would love to just know who's in the audience, um, which best describes your current role. All right, it's looking like we have lots of researchers, some healthcare providers and community members. Glad to see you here, um, some students. And um, yeah, maybe we can, now that we have, you know, most folks answering that question, we can move on to the next poll question, um, which is, which statement best describes your current experience with community engaged research approaches? All right, so yeah, it looks like we've got lots of folks who are currently doing community engaged research and are here because they'd like to improve their skills. Um, and we also have some folks that are beginners, so that's great. Hopefully we will touch on all things. Um, and please, again, feel free to put your questions in the chat so that we can tailor what we talk about to your needs today. So um, let's just get started by defining community-engaged research. Community-engaged research is an umbrella term that includes many methodologies in which community is at some point involved in the research, not just as research participants. And the NIH defines community engagement in research as a process of inclusive participation that supports mutual respect of values, 
strategies and actions for authentic partnership of people that are either affiliated with or self-identified by. This can be geographic proximity, special interest, or similar situations to address issues affecting the well-being of the community of focus. And community-engaged research exists on a continuum from no community involvement on one end to community-driven or community-led research. And several factors underlie and vary across this continuum, such as who has power and control over the project, how is decision-making shared, who has ultimate ownership and responsibility over the project, how is the project mutually beneficial, and how are resources shared? There are additional contextual factors such as the history of the institution with the surrounding community, past harms and misdeeds, um, how that impacts trust and relationship building, how respect is communicated, and how transparency is maintained. All these are interwoven into the dynamics and interactions of community-engaged research that are considerations for doing community-engaged research ethically and successfully. So to get into a little bit more of the details, you know, on one end of the spectrum, community is not involved and the researcher works independently of the community. Um, next, we have community informing the research, but they may not know that they're informing. In this case, the researchers are gleaning information from community, which informs the research, but is not including community in a defined role or is only involving community at the beginning or the end um, of research. Um, so this can also sometimes be called ear hustling. Um, next, we also have um, a community participation where the community has some active and defined role in the research, such as a community advisory council. Um, however, community advisory councils can also be used like in this ear hustling way. Um, if researchers are not planning for more meaningful participation throughout the research project. So it's important that researchers work to start the partnership at the sort of think tank stage while we are writing the proposal whenever possible. That way we can be more on the spectrum of community initiated research, where uh, research is responding to the specific needs or asks from the community. Um, next, we have community-based participatory research or CBPR, which is where community members and researchers share equally in decision-making and ownership. So this means that, um, uh, in this research, community members are in a leadership role, not simply as consultants. Um, also, research ideas must come from the community, not the researcher, for this to really be community-based participatory research. And then finally, we have uh, community-led or community-driven research. And this is where the researcher is supporting uh, community-identified research efforts as sort of a consultant or may serve no role at all. Okay, so we have another poll question. What aspects of community-engaged research do you most need support with? And of course, this is not an exhaustive list, um, but we'd love to hear from you about um, what kinds of support um, or barriers you're experiencing most. All right, just waiting for a few more folks to answer. And it looks like we've got um, some responses, you know, mostly across this, the across all answers. You know, folks have questions about how to structure um, the partnership. Um, certainly budgeting seems like a concern. Building and maintaining mutually beneficial relationships seems like a big one. Um, so we will definitely touch on um, some of these uh, throughout the talk today. 
Okay. So I also just want to pause here and see if there are any questions in the chat so far. Not that I'm seeing right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have one actually just came in. Um, in terms of CVPR, how do you manage uh, when there's overturn among community partners? Um, yeah, this is a really good question. Um, and certainly somewhat that's pretty much inevitable, right? We don't have control um, over how long folks can participate in, in partnerships. Um, you know, Paul, I'm, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about this. Sure. Um, so th this is a huge issue in a lot of um, community engagement councils. And one of the things that I always like to um, talk to folks about, especially if they're interested in um, joining a council or uh, a community group is to find out what that person's passion is, what they're really good at, what they like to do, what their role would like to be within um, the community organization. And so that really helps. Uh, what happens is a lot of times you can have 20 people around the table and out of those 20 people, there might be six who are really interested in the topics um, that you need to discuss at the moment. So really, really just really, re-engaging or engaging the folks who are most interested. Um, we on the um, Community Engaged Research Council and the CIFAR have a lot of ad hoc members. So when we need specialty uh, discussions on specific topics, we bring those people in. They're not necessarily at every meeting. And for a lot of people, they tend to stay longer because they're not attending meetings that they're really not interested in or that they don't have a passion for. So it's really finding out who your members are um, on, your, um, on your board or your council um, and see where their particular interests lie. And it's really best to use them uh, with their particular strengths. So that way you save them time. They're not at meetings that they don't really need to be at. Um, and that really helps with retention. Also getting to know who is on your council. There are many people who are on a council who don't even know each other. Um, so usually when I engage folks, I have them tell their story, like why are you here? What has been your life experience? And that really brings to um, you know, to really uh, developing a family, so to speak, because people know each other. You can have different cultures, you can have different beliefs, but when you sit and you tell your story and you have other people listening to it, it really um, lends itself to a really coherent um, and tight group of people who will be doing the work for you. Yeah, I um, just to add to that, Paul, I thought that was such a great response. I um, I ran a project over the past year that was with uh, trans women and trans feminine people of color from all across the U.S. We met on Zoom and many of the um, community members became friends with each other and became sources of support um, for each other, connecting, you know, in places or otherwise where they would not have met. Um, I think also having some grace for folks you know, attending when they can attend and not worrying about how many um, they miss, you know, knowing that folks can just come when they can and are doing their best. I also try to be really thoughtful about when I schedule my meetings with community that can actually accommodate their needs. So I'm often working on the weekends or outside of regular business hours um, to accommodate everyone's needs. Um, I think one month, one other important important aspect to add too is um, so when folks don't attend the meetings is to send them minutes uh, they don't have to be long minutes but send them bullet points these are the you know the three topics that we talked about just so people are kept in a loop um, even if they're not it's not their priority but at least they know what's going on so what happens is when people are not kept in a loop they tend to leave they tend to say well you don't really need me anyway so really just doing those small things really help um, to keep your group together yeah. One uh, last point that I will make, which I personally don't have experience with, I've more so had a project where there's continuity of the same folks across the project. Um, but I have heard of community engagement sessions that are self-contained. So there are different folks attending every time. I believe that the COBRE for opioid overdose um, has a uh, a format like this. So they do have new folks from the community attending every time. Sometimes there is some continuity of folks, um, but they have these sort of self-contained topics. Um, 
So just some different ways to, to do it. Um, so yeah, let me get back to the slides. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, there is some good news for doing community engagement while well. there are resources out there to help you. These are just two examples. Um, the one on the left is a manual and an accompanying workbook for conducting CBPR, community-based participatory research with um, Black or African-American adults living with serious mental illness. And I actually used this for my dissertation, which also had an HIV component. And the one on the right was developed by a coalition of LGBTQ affirming federally qualified health centers that worked together to create this list of principles and best practices for doing community engaged research with transgender and non binary communities. And these are both freely available online and are a great starting point to doing ethical community engaged work, even if your community or population doesn't match the communities of focus here. Um, and just to give you um, a sense of you know, what's inside one of these manuals. So this is the Inspiring Change Workbook. And this really provides a step-by-step -step outline of topics that you could cover when meeting with your community-based participatory research team. It also gives suggestions on how to structure the leadership team, which includes a representative of the community being in a leadership role, as well as a healthcare provider and a researcher. And it also breaks it down by type of research. So there's specific chapters on if you're doing research to understand a problem versus designing a solution or testing a solution. So next, I want to talk about some core principles and some key examples and ways that we can um, uphold these principles in our work. Um, so I'm going to be talking about trust, um, equity, and mutual benefit. And let's talk about trust first, because in order for academic members to become part of the community and community members to become part of the research team, we need to work to build trust. So how are we going to do that? Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is it's important that researchers come outside of the four walls of the institution and into communities to start building a relationship. We can't expect community members to come to us. Um, and we need to be asking what the community needs, what do they already know is working, but maybe you would like some more evidence about. I'm asking them what concerns they have about research um, or what kind of research would excite them. Um, this also means that at the grant writing stage, uh, particularly depending on the grant mechanism, we need to build in opportunities to be responsive to the community. So it's always important to say in the grant something like, this may change from community input or feedback. That way, when you ask these questions um, as a researcher, um, you really mean it. Um, that also means uh, that you need to budget time and multiple trips to visit your community partners in your grants. Uh, for example, I just got back from visiting Los Angeles LGBT Center um, to ask these kinds of questions to multiple stakeholders at the organization. This visit also helped um, me connect with leaders in the community organization about my ideas, which can really help uh, build momentum for a project. I also, ooh, sorry. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, one of the other things that I really like to do to start demonstrating um, that I am trustworthy and earning trust for my community partners is getting authentic with them about what connects me to this work, uh, which also means being a little bit vulnerable and perhaps taking a risk. Um, those of us in the audience may have heard the term reflexivity or a positionality statement, and I think that this can be useful when you're really able to describe how your position in society or your reflection on your identities impacts the work. So, for example, I might say something like, I'm a clinical psychologist that received formal research training in a PhD program in Chicago. So this influences my beliefs about health, well-being, and self-determination as basic human rights. Related to my PhD training, I believe that the scientific process develops knowledge and effective treatments and programs. 
I also um, have been and, and currently a therapist for people coping with chronic illness, including living with HIV in various hospital settings like academic medical centers, community-based clinics, and the VA. On the other hand, I grew up with complementary and alternative medicine practices as my mom saw treatment for her own chronic fatigue. It's also important for me to think about what other aspects of my position in society and experiences are relevant to the work. So for example, it's important for me, I think, to mention that I'm a queer woman and I grew up with LGBTQ adult role models and some out LGBTQ teens at my high school. Um, my brother went to prom with his boyfriend. Um, I also have family members and friends living with HIV. It's also important, I think, if relevant to your work, which this is often relevant in my work as I study the negative psychological effects of stigma and systems of oppression on behavioral health, um, for me to mention my understanding and relationship to racism. So for example, I'm a white person who grew up mostly surrounded by other white people in the same middle-class background in Phoenix, Arizona, as well as a community of Mexican and Mexican-American folks, usually of lower class backgrounds. An immediate family member of mine was undocumented during Sheriff Joe Arpaio's uh, nearly 25 year term. And for those who don't know who Sheriff Joe Arpaio was, he was infamously indicted by a federal judge for racial pro profiling in detaining uh, quote unquote individuals suspected of being in the US illegally. And he was um, later pardoned, unfortunately, by Donald Trump. So my understanding of racism growing up was in the context of, quote unquote, immigration issues. And I learned much more about anti-Black racism when I moved to Chicago in 2014. So I'm able to relate to and express authentic empathy and cultural humility through this accurate view of myself. Um, this also means that I need to do the work to understand the history of the institution and its relationship to the community uh, that I'm working with and acknowledge past mistakes and harms. We often talk about Tuskegee as we learn um, about in our IRB required human protection training, but there is a significant history of medical experimentation on Black, Indigenous, and communities of color that extends far beyond Tuskegee and in modern day. Um, so this book, uh, Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington, is just one resource to learn more about this history. Thirdly, I want to say that sometimes it helps to start small and build up to a bigger project with your community members. You know, think about, is there a pilot or smaller project that you could start with to demonstrate how you engage with community? Perhaps after this project, the community organization or individuals that um, you're working with will be interested in a larger project or longer commitment. Uh, for example, you may start with a pilot grant to do formative work with community and then build in lots of capacity and relationship building into that pilot. Um, and then when you apply for the larger grant, you already have that relationship with community to get involved at the grant writing stage. Okay, so I wanna pause here for questions about trust before I get into equity. There was uh, one question, uh, Aaron, related to ethical principles mm -hmm. um, in terms of what is an effective way to assess the uh, what is an effective way to assess the effect of ethical principles and community engagement, where community advisory boards is the main method of community engagement. Can you say it one more time? Yeah, um, and and I might invite. Uh, Nitha to meet themselves, uh, maybe. Um, but what is an effective way to assess the effect of ethical principles in community engagement, where community advisory boards, CABS, is the main method of community engagement? Yeah, like, like how do we know uh, what we're doing is actually uh, doing what we say it's doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like maintaining trust and mutual benefit and 
and equity? That's a that's a really good question. Um, and I think, I mean, that could be done in a number of ways. Um, and it's a bit it's a bit meta, right? It would almost be a research question about the process of CBPR. Um, I believe actually that the larger grant project that my dissertation was part of was doing such a process. So it was um, funded by a PCORI Eugene Washington Engagement Award. And the project um, created that inspiring change manual using CBPR and then funded two smaller pilot projects to use the manual. So my dissertation was one of those pilot projects. And then they interviewed us and this, the rest of the team afterwards to ask like, how, how did doing this project go? Um, and so you might think about um, doing something similar where the, it's almost uh, like similar to implementation science of evaluating in interviews, um, how did using these principles go? Did you feel respected? Did your needs get met? Um, yeah, I don't know if Paul, if you have additional thoughts about that. Um, I do. I actually just wanted to just bring up a few things. So when we, um, Aaron first talked about, um, you know, writing for a grant and then going out into the community, I would challenge that and saying, go out to the community first before you write your grant. Because I think having conversations with the outside community will really help save you a step instead of writing and then going back to the community and saying, what do you think about this? And one of the important things, I think first people have to listen. Don't talk, go out into the community and listen and listen to what you're hearing. Then you can speak to what you are planning for your research and having folks um, be involved right from the very beginning. I think especially with um, IRB and you know, ethics, I think what's really important is to make sure that the community members or the community, whoever you're engaging is engaged right at the very beginning. Because what happens if that engagement doesn't happen at the beginning and it happens in the middle or at the end, we call that helicopter research, right? You come in, you grab your participants, you do what you need to do, and then you're out and nothing happens. Nothing, there's no, um, there's no give back to the participants um, and they're left wondering what happened, how did my participation matter? And when we talk about building community uh, and building engagement, you lose your community right there because word gets around. As Aaron said, you know, we need to listen to the stories, whether it's about past history, whether it's about Tuskegee, Henrietta Lacks. We know there are cultures who have a long history of storytelling and those stories come through the generations and are bought from generation to one generation to the other. So I think it's just really important to have those conversations right at the very beginning. I mean, there are some research projects that you don't need human subjects, whether it's biostats or some statistical data that you may not necessarily need the community for, but anything, anything that engages human subjects, um, you need to be including the people who will be participants right from the very beginning, from the conception of the idea. We at the CIFAR in uh, the Providence, Boston have what we call think tanks, where we community actually attends the think tanks and listen to what um, uh, the person is talking about for their grant or their research. Another important thing to remember is language, is how you address, how you write your research, how you write your grant, making sure that the terms are not discriminatory and not stigmatizing, you know, like HIV infected. There are so many terms that when I read um, research proposals, I'm appalled. It's like we have to remember that language is very important because language and the way you state things can really turn your community off and really disengage them as opposed to engage them. Mm, thanks for that, Paul. Um, really, really important points. Um, so yeah, let me talk next about um, equity, which means you know maintaining equal and shared decision making, understanding where power lies and how to share power, and flexibility in pursuing goals methods and timeframes to fit the priorities, needs, and capacities within the cultural context of communities. So thinking about how to plan for community to be engaged in your research, you want to think about, will you have a community advisory council? 
will you engage with an established council or board, or are you going to recruit members specific to your project? What kinds of stakeholders do you want involved? Um, will the council members each have an equal role, or will there be some leaders? What kinds of questions will you bring to your community members? Make sure that these questions are actionable, um, not just uh, things that don't really matter in the um, bigger term of the research. Um, I also want to make a note to make sure that the questions are not just about recruitment as well. Community members, you know, I think are a little bit um, sometimes tired of the question about recruitment. How can you, you know, get your community members to come and participate in my research? There's a lot more to contribute than, than just, um, you know, how to get connected with folks. Um, I also think about um, education is important. Uh, the researcher needs to think about ways to make sure that community members can meaningfully engage in shared decision making. So that means investing time in meetings to provide education on the research process, such as what is a human research uh, protection program or institutional review board, what are the different kinds of applications and processes associated with that um, process, uh, how to interpret data, um, or for example, I gave a brief training um, to my community members on psychometrics and how questionnaires are developed so that my community members could understand with me the trade-offs that we were making when we were making changes to the wording of items and existing questionnaires so that they're more appropriate to the population that we're studying. You know, and of course, again, this all means that it's super important to budget for this time in your grants. Um, and it's important in that budget to really prioritize the partnership building, um, thinking about how many community advisory council meetings will you need, um, how many trips, it should be multiple trips to visit community partners or your community-based organizations, and really thinking of your community partners as co-investigators. How would you pay a co-investigator's time uh, to be a part of your project? Um, thinking of community the same. Um, so this also means that when we're getting feedback uh, from community, we as researchers, I want to earnestly do my best to implement that feedback and also be honest with my community partners about any limitations that I have in making changes to the research study, um, as well as my responsibilities to funders. Um, but overall, I, I need to be um, willing to be flexible. And again, it helps if you can build that flexibility in um, to the grant. Um, so sometimes this also means trying new things which will mean potentially changing the project, like that eligibility criteria um, is one thing I experienced recently, or changing the measures used. Um, it also might mean that you tried something and learned that it's outside the scope of the current project, but will lead to another grant um, or research idea. And even if you expect this to be the case early on, it's important that you demonstrate a willingness to try ideas out um, that the community has. So this is happening with my K award right now. The grant was developed to focus on transgender women of color and focusing on HIV um, risk and acquisition and transmission. And my community partner said, you know, we have a lot of trans masculine and non-binary folks who are also at risk of HIV transmission and acquisition. Um, could we, is there opportunity to focus um, your grant on them as well. So what we're able to do is add some additional interviews and focus groups at the formative stage to include trans masculine and non-binary folks. So that way we can make an informed decision about how this intervention should be framed and developed. Should it focus just on trans women and be a space for just trans feminine folks? Or can we include um, broader gender expansive communities? 
And it might be the case that we find that there's another grant to be written that's going to focus the intervention specifically on transmasculine folks, and that's okay. But at least, um, you know, we're doing the work at the, the beginning stages to learn that. <clears throat> So I also think it's important to share credit for the work. This means including your community partners in dissemination, having authorship role on publications and presentations. Um, for example, this is a publication from my dissertation where we had um, community members, healthcare providers, um, and researchers on, as authors. Um, and this also means that we should be thoughtful about the skills and contributions that our community members can make. Some members of the team will be very interested in writing and editing, while others may not be as interested in that. Um, but as long as someone had a role in making design decisions, I think that they should be included. I think it's also important to think really early on about the long term the longevity and sustainability of the project. Um, and I, I think it's important to start thinking about this really early on and communicating this with partners so that community members don't feel abandoned if you take a new direction in your research program or funding priorities change. I hear all the time that communities feel researchers come in, do their research, and then you know they're never seen again. And like any relationship, there needs um, to be work that's put in to maintain it. So I think we as researchers need to keep that in mind and not sort of accidentally or purposefully ghost our community partners or leave them on red. Um, okay, so let me pause there and see if there's any questions or additional thoughts from Paul. Um, so I just would like to comment on what Amy just talked about. And I think Amy gives a perfect example of how we can ensure that the value of community advocates add to the HIV clinical research in a more biodirectional and less exploitative way. I mean, obviously having authorship roles, being able to edit, um, give presentations um, is all part of the give back. I think one of the biggest mistakes that researchers make is um, as Aaron spoke so eloquently before about you know, grabbing the people coming in and never to be seen again. So which which I um, previously referred to as helicopter research. So I think it's just really important to make sure that once the research project is finished or, or, or is completed or and continues is to make sure that you have the participants uh, continued ear. In other words, make sure you get back to them and say, you know, gee, thank you for participating in this. This is what happened. This is what we got from the results. This is what we're going to do. Um, here's a guide for your agency on what we talked about. Here's a, uh, you know, a text guide, a teaching guide, or whatever it might be. But you need to get back to the community because as you work in one community to work on one research project, it will really affect any research project you do because it starts to build trust in the compute in the community. You know, here these folks came in. Um, we were participants in their research project. They came back to us, gave us a toolbox or whatever it might be. And those conversations continue to happen into the community. So that's how you continue. It's one way to continue building up partnerships within the community and getting to know your community more. And that's really, really important because the last thing you want to do is to keep starting over, to keep starting over, to say, who am I going to go to? You have leaders on your particular committee. Uh, and as Aaron mentioned earlier, they became friends, they knew other people in the community. So to really be able to build on that, to maintain that trust, to build that trust, and to really seek out leaders in the community who are trusted members of the community can really help you um, in your research um, project. And then are there any questions in the chat? There are, um, but just want to be mindful of, of time and um, how y'all are doing. Okay. Um, we can, I, I just have one section left, so maybe I'll do that section and then we can. Okay. Questions Perfect. Okay, great. Um, yeah, especially because this is my favorite section. So we're going to talk about mutual benefit. So this is where research is providing resources and funding to train, employ, and build capacity of community members in all aspects of the research process. 
And truthfully, this is my favorite part of my work. Um, when my work can build capacity or facilitate a community member's professional goals or personal goals, um, that's what really makes me feel like I'm doing something good. Um, so I think that we can think about this using the social ecological model and how community engaged research creates mutual benefits on individual, interpersonal, community, institutional, and structural levels. You know, at the individual level, I can be a mentor or a, a source of support for my community members. Um, I've done things like written recommendation letters for graduate school programs for my community members or for other employment, um, uh, which, you know, can help them uh, achieve their own professional goals or other higher education programs. Um, also with continued funding and growth in a research program, I've seen centers hire peers as full-time peer researchers and coordinators. Um, community members may also stay on in other roles. Um, another example, one of my lived experience team members is planning to go to school to become a mental health counselor and has expressed interest in staying on the study as a peer um, intervention facilitator. On an interpersonal level, um, as a researcher, you bring a connection to university resources and connections. Your community um, advisory council members now have connections to the university through you. You can let them know about other studies they can get involved with and just other opportunities to get involved in what's going on at the university. On the community level, um, research can increase access to services. For example, um, a research study can create um, or support study positions at community-based organizations for peers. Um, and although in intervention studies, we don't yet know if the intervention is effective, sometimes our control condition or aspects of the intervention have components that can increase access to services and support. On an institutional level, um, this could eventually lead to permanent positions in healthcare systems for peers. For example, uh, the VA has full-time peer navigator positions in many of their clinics um, that the mental health service line touches. As well as on the structural level, um, research sometimes contributes to actual policy change or can support policy change. Uh, for example, Dr. Amy Nunn um, here at Brown ran a research study that brought fresh fruits and vegetables to low-income neighborhoods, and this project was then later able to lobby for an actual policy change in Rhode Island that would make fresh fruits and vegetables half off for individuals using um, food stamps. So I would love to hear from you all, if you could please write in the chat, what examples of mutual benefit have you seen in your work and what ideas do you have about how community engaged research can create mutual benefit? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, so maybe do you want to move on to the next slide just for the sake of time? Yeah, so oh, we can oh, nope. I'm, I'm seeing stuff now. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so some folks are saying developing a community structure that reviews community engage, uh, community engagement aspects in all research, uh, okay. helping to connect community members to call and uh, to colleagues uh, about graduate studies. Um, Providing information to agencies for program evaluation and needs assessments, uh, efforts for their grants, writing, and funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is all great. Um, so yeah, with the time that we have left, let's see if there's any questions. I did see there was a question earlier um, that I think is really interesting. 
the, with more opportunities to underrepresented groups getting into graduate programs, we should expect that some PIs in the future will be members of the communities being studied. How does that play into our definition of CDPR? I mean, I think this happens today all the time. Um, and I actually heard um, a speaker talk about this very directly. I was at um, the Intersectionality Training Institute um, monthly research salon, which is a great place to come and learn more, all things intersectionality and community engaged research as well. Um, and she is the director and founder of a community-based organization. So she is community, but is also currently earning a PhD um, in epidemiology and wonders about, you know, if, if it's her research idea, is it just sort of like automatically CBPR um, or is it automatically community initiated? And she talked about how important it is for her to have people around her to keep her in check because although she has community lived experience, she is still representing the research institute side and is getting this additional training. And of course, just like we would never want to tokenize uh, a person or think that one person represents the experiences of all people, um, we also don't wanna do that in our CBPR kinds of settings as well. So the more people that we can have around us that are representing a range of experiences, um, I think is, is the better. Um, what do you think, Paul? So I, let me just make sure my mic is on. Uh, so I definitely think um, diversity is, is the key here. And as you said earlier, just having one person's life experience, it brings a lot to the table, but it's not, uh, it's not everyone's experience and not that you can get everyone's experience all at once, but it's really good to have sort of a really well-rounded um, look at whatever it is that you're looking at, not just relying on one person's one person's expertise, but rather have a group to have those checks and balances that are really important to make sure that the that the project is successful. Um, there was a question about how large should a cab be? Um, and what is the role and responsibilities? So I think um, I wanted to just address that a little bit because so many people ask that question and a lot of folks use the one size fits all for cabs. Um, and I personally don't like the word cab. Uh, I would prefer a council. I think sort of the cab is an outdated term at this point. Um, but I think what happens is, um, you know, it's all depending on the project that you're working on. And the responsibilities um, of the CAB are to be discussed with the researcher. What is it that the researcher needs? What is it that the community needs? It's a two-way conversation. So it's really about building, you know, building your block, building your building, and working uh, closely in collaboration with the, with one another. And I think, you know, um, bigger is not always better. Uh, you can have, like I said earlier, you can have 20 people sitting on a council and, you know, five people do all the work. So it really should be tailored to whatever the particular research project is, what the needs of the community is, and what the needs of the researcher is. So there's no real set formula um, for a council. Again, it's all uh, dependent on the project that you're working on and should be tailored to do, to do so because the one size uh, fits all doesn't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I think um, like for me personally, I think it's worked well to have a size that's sort of similar to what what works well as a focus group or even like a therapy group or sort of the number of boxes that can fit on my Zoom screen. Um, because if I'm th thinking about facilitating a productive group conversation, um, having too large of a size can be a little bit challenging and too small, you're sort of not getting enough uh, variety and, and different ideas. So if you do have a larger group, you know, thinking about breakout rooms and things like that for discussions, I, I think is also helpful because I always um, I always want to make sure that people feel comfortable to also speak up in, in settings as well. Um, I don't want to have a CBPR or community engaged research team meeting and no one's talking. Um, so what other questions are um, do folks have or other thoughts from you, Paul?
We have another uh, question in the chat. So what is our collective role to have experienced members of CABs part of grants prior to submission? Are we addressing tokenism with funders and what more can we do? So I, I, I think it's really important um, that we that researchers have a role, the institutions have a role to make sure that the community is present at the table. And however you do that, whether you call it a cab, whether you call it a council, but again, it's not about checking the box and it's not about the yes or no, uh, you know, inactionable questions. It's really about taking the community along with you and working with you. Um, and that's the really important part. Uh, again, you know, there are so many agencies that do the tokenistic thing, you know, just I, I gave our council or CAB members a questionnaire and they were all yes and no answers and we're done. We wash our hands out of it. But I think Amy addressed that, um, Aaron, I'm sorry, addressed that uh, previously about giving people the opportunity to learn, to grow, to, to have mentorship, to be published, uh, to educate. Um, all those things are part of the process that really helps people uh, become more experienced and then want to do more and to, to be part of the research uh, community. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if I have much to add um, to Paul. I, I am thinking though about, um, I, I think that researchers, or at least I've found myself in this situation where I feel stuck between a catch-22 sometimes, where um, I'm nervous about asking community members to um, talk to me or contribute to my grant idea before I have money to properly compensate them for their time. And so then it's this sort of, especially with, um, I think, NIH funding, the way that it's set up, you need to have a lot of your ideas very specifically specified before you put, put in the grant, and then they give you the money, and then you can, you know, properly pay your community members for their time um, and then get the feedback. There are other mechanisms that exist that are more related to capacity building, like these Kokori Eugene Washington Engagement Awards. Um, there is another mechanism at NIH, I think it's an R30 something, it's a, it's an R, it's, so it's one that is focused on capacity building that allows you to not have these specific research aims in mind, um, so that can really help, or contacting, you know, like, um, the existing CIFAR, um, council to, talk about ideas, you know, that's something that's already set up um, to get some feedback early on. And with one minute left, I wanna bring this to a close. Um, I know both of our presenters are happy to connect with folks offline. Um, so uh, please feel free uh, to connect with them and to email them. And from the uh, CIRA and CIFAR, we wanna thank you both so much um, for your time, your insights, um, and your knowledge today. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Paul and Aaron. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Daniel and Pete um, as well for their help in putting this together today.